Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending to today's uh, webinar on uh, Media Composer, Ask Mary Ann, Volume 2. So we're so happy to have with us Mary Ann today, and let us know where you're watching us from. We'll quickly do our housekeeping items if you're following us on Zoom. Your audio is uh, muted, and this is recorded, so we can post these back to live online learning webinars at avid.com. Uh, tell us where you're watching us from. We'd love to hear that. And if you are following us on Zoom, you have the Q&A field. You can enter it. Also enter them in social. I'll try to monitor as many seats as possible while we go through the process. Uh, so all of you know Mary Ann Post. She's one of our AVID master instructors and writes a lot of our content uh, as well. So Mary Ann, so happy to have you today with this Ask Mary Ann session. So are you hearing me okay, Mary Ann? I'm hearing you. Perfect. Thanks. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and get started. We did have a volume one, which I think is where we left off with some questions around time code. So if you could um, cover and share some of the features uh, that time code has, and we'll start with that. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Welcome everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Hopefully everybody can see Media Composer here. So yeah, in part one, we started working with a little bit of time code as we were running out of time. So uh, the question was to ask, uh, to go over some features. My number one feature is if, if you need to look at a variety of types of time code, call up two rows of information in the Composer window. And um, I'm just gonna right click in my Composer window and grab my composer settings if I activate it first. There we go, composer settings. And then I already have this already displayed. Um, so it's not a default and that's where you'll get it um, through your composer settings. And then to, with navigation, uh, we're just talking about lead zeros is kind of where we left off. Right now you can see like I'm at about um, zero hours and two minutes in the source clip. If I need to go to the three minute mark, I don't need to type in the hours. I can just go ahead and start typing. Now, if you're on a numeric keypad, you just start typing. If you're on a laptop like I am, you're not gonna be able to type. So I just hit control twice and you can see the window comes up and then I can type it. So I don't need to type the zero to go to three minutes for zero hours. I just type three. And then instead of doing four zeros for zero seconds, zero frames, I'm actually just gonna type period and that gives me my seconds, period again, that gives me my frames. So you can start typing time codes super fast. I hit return, I'm on the Mac, enter on Windows, and there we go, okay? So when you're navigating, you don't need to type in the lead zero. So like if I just need to go to three minutes and 15 frames, now all I'd have to type is, I just hit control twice, 15, return, none of the lead zeros before that, and there I am. Um, the other thing with navigating is if you wanna navigate forwards and backwards. So like if I wanna just kind of go through this clip at a certain increment, maybe um, this is a fairly short clip, so I'm gonna pick something short like 10 seconds. Um, I'd go plus or minus to go forwards and backwards. So on numeric keypad, you just start typing, otherwise it's control twice. I'm gonna hit plus, and then I'm gonna hit 10 for seconds. That's a period, so I don't have to do the two zeros. And I just went forwards uh, 10 seconds. So I'm at three, 10, 15. If I hit return again, enter on windows, it's just gonna take me through at 10 second increments. So if you need to do something like that. I tend to do this in the timeline, like if I have a photo montage or something and all the photos are the exact same length, doing that takes me, uh, clip by clip by clip. So I could say it's three twelves. Uh, so plus three seconds, 12 frames, and just keep going. And I just step through all my photos is a shortcut for that. And you can do the same thing in reverse. So if I hit control twice for me, minus, and I'm going to go five seconds, it'll now take me back in time. And you too, if you do this. Uh, so a couple navigation tips that can really streamline, especially the using the period in place of two zeros, because um, oftentimes I don't type enough zeros and don't go anywhere. Uh, when you're setting durations, 
uh, the media composer sets durations based on something called frame inclusive. I just marked an in. And if you look at the center duration up top, it says one frame. As soon as you mark it in or mark it out, you automatically get a frame. Uh, this is a computer need, and this is not a media composer thing. In fact, you probably have run into this in other applications as well. Uh, my tip is because we have so many different frame rates these days, uh, I don't just memorize my frame rate. I just use a quick trick because by the time I recall which frame rate I'm in, um, I could have used this trick. So what I usually do is I want to make a three second duration for this. So I'm going to uh, get into the data entry, either start typing on your numeric keypad or I just hit the control key again. And I'm going to do shift plus there and do my three seconds, three period. Notice that it says 301 and I'm already getting a duration because my of my playhead. Center duration is such a valuable tool. Uh, it will constantly update. So right now, when I have in and out marks, it's always telling me the distance, the duration between my in or out in my playhead. When you're at the beginning of a clip, it's telling you the full clip's duration, uh, that kind of thing. So when I look at this, all I have to do is back up a frame and then I've got my um, solid three seconds. So if you need an even number, which isn't for me all the time. I'm more rhythm based where I like to play and find my footage and that kind of thing. But if I'm in a time constraint where it has to be a very specific number, I always, whatever that needs to be, just back up a frame. And same thing like if I'm gonna do an out, so maybe this trick at the end of this trick here, I'm gonna hit the G key on my keyboard to clear my marks. Although my keyboard is, there they go. It's a little delay there. Okay, so this time I'm gonna mark an out. Notice again, I get one frame because the playhead's before this. And then I'm going to minus back time it. So numeric keypad, or I just hit control twice. Minus, and let's do uh, like three and a half seconds. So I'm gonna do my three, one, two, return. Now as I get that extra frame, this time to get my out, I need to go four is one frame. Okay, and I do that. And that way I don't have to be like, okay, I'm in 24 frames per second and do that fast math, which for me is not very fast at all. And so a little bit about frame inclusive. Um, all these navigation tips also work in the timeline. Um, before I do a couple in the timeline, just a quick uh, note about another note about center duration. Um, so I'm going to clear my marks and go to the beginning of my clip. Now it's showing me the full duration of the shot. Um, as I make my way through the clip, it's actually telling me remaining time. I'm two minutes from the end. If you end up clicking on center duration, which I've done by mistake, it's going to start giving you frame counts. So I'm 2,892 frames from the end of my clip. And you can see those numbers are going down. Um, you can just click on this again to get back to time code, or if you need frame count, you can click on this to get your frame count. If you're given frame values, hey, can we move forward, uh, you know, 48 frames or 120 frames, uh, you can type that in as well. So if I mark my in here uh, and I want to go, you know, forwards, I'm going to do over 100 because that's going to be where things get a little weird. If I need to go 48 frames, it's plus 48. Um, and that's fine. But once you get over 100, if I type in 120 right now, it's going to think I want to move forward a second and 20 frames, which I think is 44 frames. Don't hold me to my math. I want to go frames though. All I have to do is hit an F. And now I'm that's 120 frames. When I hit enter, it takes me to that spot. If I need the five seconds or whatever, or the 120 frames, back up a frame and mark my out. Okay. So yeah, so any if you were doing a frame count, anything above 100, you want to add the F. Um, so it'll translate to time code for you. And then the same thing in the timeline. If I need to just go to the 40 second mark, it works the exact same spot. Maybe I have a note on a correction I need to make. I'm just going to, I'm now, because I'm in my timeline, the box pops up on the right monitor. Hopefully you guys can see that. And um, one hour, zero minutes, and then seconds and frames. I do not, to go to 40 seconds, need to type in the one hour um, minutes, that kind of thing. I can just type in 40, period, and enter. So you'll get really fast, really quick, 
with time codes. Okay, so now I'm navigating, so I don't have to worry about frame inclusive. Do I subtract a frame or not? Uh, no, if you're just moving your playhead, just move it, um, type in the values. When I wanna set a duration, so if I'm gonna put a title in here that's gonna be five seconds, uh, I can mark my in, that's when I have to pay attention. And I just type in my duration I want. Okay, and then you'll see your center duration, back up a frame and out. Okay, so that's when you worry about it only is in and out marks. Uh, if you need more time code options, you've got all your pop-up menus, always pick the bottom one, otherwise you're not gonna be able to navigate. And you've got your duration of your whole uh, sequence or clip into out duration, absolute, how far from the beginning you are, and then remaining how far from the end you are. And then um, you also have a whole time code tool that pretty much works the same as well that you can call up. And this is a menu that you just left click on and you get all your options in addition to adding pretty much infinite number of lines um, and changing font sizes and that kind of thing. Okay, so you can do that. So enough on time code. Um, who knew it could be such a deep topic? Uh, what's next? Well, let's see, we have a multi-part question for this one. How do okay. you suggest handling a clip with several audio channels? Is it possible to group different channels in different way than, than set multi-channel track under modified clip? Okay, yeah, so this came up actually in our last session and I didn't have an audio clip to be able to show this. But basically what they're referring to is that when you bring in audio, if you wanna regroup the channels that you go to the clip and modify clip function to do that. Um, the alternative is to do it on import. So I'm just gonna right click in my bin and I'm in an audio bin right now, so go to my source browser. Um, and it's just about setting up your link option or your import option before you link or import. So they're the same um, as far as setup goes. So right now I'm just in link and I just, I'm on my desktop. I just grab like a variety of types of audio clips. And I've got this music that's labeled stereo and I'm having a selection. Oh, there it goes. Um, my system's a little slow at the moment for some reason. Okay, so I've got this music clip that says stereo. Um, it's always good to label how these are supposed to be so you're not guessing. Otherwise, go back to the source if you can. And essentially, there's a gear icon that I just clicked really fast. So this gear icon is the setting. So I'm gonna go to link settings because that's active. And there's link options. And right now, multi-channel set to none, which means anything I import right now or link will be brought in as mono channels as a general rule, okay? This applies definitely for stereo and for surround, it depends on your version of Media Composer. So you wanna do a little testing and then you'll know your settings for your version of the software I found. So if I go to edit right now, um, right now I'm set up every channel is gonna have its own track on the source side over here. So if I click this button, then I'll have stereo. So if you're gonna do a bunch of linking of things that are gonna be in stereo, set this up ahead of time and then you don't have to go to the modify menu. And then I'm gonna click okay. And then when I link this, we'll see and load it. I now have an A1 with the, and I know it's tiny over uh, social and Zoom, but that's a stereo speaker icon. Uh, whereas right now, if I go to import, I have a second example here, and I go to my gear icon, it looks slightly different. It's the classic audio that's existed for a long, long time. Notice this is set to none. They keep it separate because a lot of people are linking one way and importing another way. That way you can have two sets of settings going at once. So in this case, I'm just gonna keep this as none. Um, and when I import, it's going to do mono tracks. So I'm gonna click okay. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and import this. There we go. And now when I load that, that's two separate tracks. So they're not grouped together. So if this one did need to be grouped together, this might be what you guys are using. 
then I would either need to re-import, but why do that when you can just right click on your clip, go to modify and the modify clip and set multi-channel audio. So then, there it goes, <laughs> delay, I'm so impatient. So then I could set it up as stereo as I need to, or if it were stereo, um, ungroup them, okay? I just wanna mention briefly about surround sound. This is a surround uh, clip. If I go to get info at the desktop level, it tells me that it's 5.1, so it's six channels. Um, this depends on which version of Media Composer you have. I'm gonna go back to link a second. And when I go to my link options, I'm set to stereo. Uh, and so I'm just gonna go back to mono. All right, so this is basically the default settings. I think where Media Composer is heading is that it'll say, oh, look, auto detect for you so you don't have to keep changing the settings. So I'm at mono, so technically I should get six source side um, tracks. When I link this and open it, it's and it's tiny, 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 but notice it's one and it has a little 5.1 surround. Okay, so it auto detected it. Uh, so depending on what iteration uh, you're working with, with a uh, version of Media Composer, you may get six tracks if you don't change the setting. Or like me, I was at mono, it auto set it for me. Okay. And then if I did need it to be individual, because maybe I'm doing the mixing, hopefully not, um, it's not my expertise, I could again, right click, come into modify and make the necessary changes within the uh, multi-channel uh, section. And then finally, if you're given individual files, uh, this one you will wanna pay attention to because these will come in in interesting fashion if you don't pay attention. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and set my setting. So in link options and import settings, this is on by default. There's a setting that's auto detect broadcast wave monophonic groups. So if you do get individual files, this is gonna tell you to group them together. Um, under the edit tab, uh, they will come in as six individual tracks for display. So if you do wanna group these together ahead of time because you're doing multiples of these, uh, you can actually click this as a menu and you have your types of surround sound monitoring. Uh, how was it put together? Was it based on SMPTE uh, standards or Pro Tools standards? This is just how they're grouped. What's gonna play through the left? What's gonna be played through the right and center and so forth. So you'll see there's multiple configurations. Uh, this one was configured for Pro Tools. So I'm gonna select that. It doesn't mean it won't do it. It just might be things aren't coming from where you think they should be um, kind of things. So you might have to ask, how is this created? Uh, so then I'm gonna just click okay to that. And because I have the auto detect on, when I click okay to this and select all, I'm gonna do a command A, control A on Windows and link this, okay? When I load it, it's also a, uh, surround sound. Otherwise, it would be the six channels lined up, okay? And again, you can modify these, but if you're doing a bunch of imports, especially on the stereo side, uh, set it up through either your link settings or your import settings ahead of time, and then that'll get you there. Um, as far as like in the timeline and that kind of thing, uh, structure-wise, uh, there's not much we can do as far as like organizing other than like if you can group them together so you don't have six uh, tracks of audio to contend with, that's the ideal. Um, or if you're like, okay, with the other clip that came in and uh, if it you need to break it up, because my version of Media Composer, this one automatically linked even when I had it set to mono tracks. If that's happening, you're like, wait, I have to do this for myself in the timeline. You can break them apart by just right clicking on the track control panel, um, track selector panel and split 
tracks. You want to make sure you right click right on the track selector to get this option. And then when I do that, now I have them. All right. Which um, I'd rather not have to deal with all this, but if you're the one setting all the panning and all that kind of thing, that's just kind of the reality of it, how it's grouped. Okay. There is not a group option, by the way. Um, and because I that was my follow-up question when I learned about split. All right. Um, hopefully that takes care of that one and helps people out on the way in and not always having to go to modify as a separate step. What's next? Awesome. Awesome. So here you go. Um, how do you create a soft drop shadow for a pip effect using the paint effect? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I every once in a while will look this up to see if uh, any answers or anything have changed. Um, there's always a lot of chatter about this. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sequence that's got two picture in pictures. And to start, I'm just going to go into an effects look here and see if we can make this just a little bit bigger for right now. There we go. Okay, so this is just a straight up picture in picture. So um, what the common answer is I, I see is uh, promote to 3D. So I promote to 3D and great. Yep, there's a drop shadow parameter that wasn't there in the straight up picture in picture. When I turn it on though, it's a hard edge. Okay, I've got transparency, uh, but still, and I'm in 2020.10. So still no soft drop shadow yet. Um, so we do have to do a workaround. There are like effects packages and that kind of thing. Um, and if you're wondering what those are, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there are those things, but you can do it from within Media Composer. I'm gonna move my zoom controls to do this. All right, there we go. Okay, so we can do this in Media Composer. It just uh, takes a moment, but I don't have to hop out and grab effects packages and that kind of thing to do this. So trade-offs. So I'm just gonna go to my segment arrow first of all, cause my drop shadow is gonna go behind this shot and I'm just gonna move this up. So I'm holding down shift and command so this doesn't move left and right. Not that it really matters for this. And then I still need to move my zoom controls further. There we go. Okay, so then I'm gonna add a paint effect to V2. So it's a multi-layer effect, okay? So to make it the exact same duration, I'm gonna command click to go to the first frame of this shot and add edit, control click on Windows. I'm just V2 selected, as you guys probably most of you, if not all of you guys know, um, tracks always matter in Media Composer. And then I'm gonna go to the end of the shot. I just hit command click again, and I'm gonna hit add edit again. So it probably doesn't look like much. Um, I could barely see it, but they're there. And then from my image category, I'm going to grab the paint effect and I'm not in effects uh, mode right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag and drop it. There we go. Now I'm in effects mode and you can see it's on the filler. Then with here, I'm just going to draw a full size shadow color screen. Okay. With my rectangle and you can be super sloppy with this because you want to fit the whole space. There we go. Okay, so if red's my color, great. Um, if red is not going to be your drop shadows color, you need to reveal your paint options. And then with this active, I'm gonna go ahead and double click, grab a nice dark color, click okay. So there we go, that's all I need to do with paint. Now you're probably thinking that doesn't look like a drop shadow and you would be right. It takes two effects. Now we just need to add an animat on top of this. Your animat should always go on the outside. Anything that's um, creating a shape or cutout, a mask of some sort or a mat of some sort, outermost effect every time. So I'm gonna auto nest. This is selected, I'm in effects mode. So I'm just gonna hold down my option key on the Mac, Alt on Windows, double clicked, and there we go. Now I'm gonna draw this shape. Now I don't have a lot of real estate space, so I can't really zoom in because I'm I am actually have a magnified resolution trying to help you guys see here. So I'm just gonna kind of eyeball this. Oh, and I clicked in a terrible spot, but that's okay. That's why they made refining tools just for me. 
Okay, so I just cut out basically the matte shape. And then um, to create the drop shadow, I'm just gonna pull this off. There we go, so there it is. Okay, that's a good start. But that's looking very similar to the 3D warp. So you might be wondering why. Um, let me just zoom that back in. Over in the shape parameters, we've got feathering. So I can feather this. And then I can also under mode, it's not opening, there we go, uh, change the opacity. Okay, so now let me make this bigger so you can see the result. So that's a really super fast one. I step out of effects mode and you got a soft drop shadow. It just takes, just takes a couple layers um, to do. And then you can always save this as a template and that kind of thing. So a um, little nicer than the 3D warp one until we get a soft drop shadow in 3D warp. And then um, we won't have to do this anymore. All right. So how are we doing for time? <laughs> awesome. We're doing good. I think we can fit one more question here. Um, okay, cool. Also, those that are watching us on the social feed, if you do have a question, go ahead and still get it in. Uh, we'd love to know what those questions are. We can add those to future sessions uh, with Marianne or other, um, you know, whether it's Pro Tools. So go ahead and get any of those questions in and we'll see what we can do about getting someone to answer them. <laughs> Right. So Mary Ann, next question is, how do you duplicate a subject in a shot with Animat? Yeah, um, I did this in another session, uh, uh, jam pack session. So um, I created a super simple one for this. The steps are gonna be exactly the same regardless of how complex your image is. But here's the story here, the setup. I've got this fruit and I'm not gonna play full screen because the best footage I could get that's a quick cutout was this time-lapse footage of this melon hanging out for who knows how long, okay? So what they want is two of these. So this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a copy of this clip. So I'm in my red segment arrow, I'm gonna click my segment and then I'm going to hold down the option key alt on windows and when you do that and then if I add shift I can constrain vertically I've just made a copy okay and if you've got the move up and down uh map to your keyboard you can also do option up arrow as well to make a copy okay so then this has a speed effect on it so we want the second one to be a little bit slower so i'm just going to pop into my motion effect editor you can see the original is like 420 percent i'm going to take this down make this one slower and so let's do like 200 percent there we go so a little bit of time warp um, if it's not on there already uh you can grab it from the time warp category in your effects palette there we go. So this one's doing kind of the same thing, um, just slower. Okay, so then I'm gonna pop back into effects mode and I already created a map for this because I knew the timing was gonna be tight. So basically what we wanna do then is add an animat, which is we were just on for the last example in your key category. Um, I happen to save one to a bin, so I'm just gonna double click that. My bin now is an effects palette. And we'll see, there's the cutout I created. It's super, I'm fortunate because this is on a pretty white background. I could be pretty sloppy with this. So it's a pretty basic shape. And so the first keyframe's done. If I go to the last keyframe, then I can just alter my shape, um, add points and that kind of thing. Um, due to time, I'm not gonna do that, but maybe I'll just scale this down a little bit. Okay. And Oddly, it's like punching through back to the first frame, but little nuance there. So yeah, so this is just slightly changing size over time. So if you had shape alteration, you'd adjust those keyframes. If you've got movement, you might be tracking or add keyframes in between using all those other tools that we've covered in previous sessions. Now that that's set, the key with this, which is why I wanted to keep it simple, is it's two effects again. This time I need a 3D warp or like a picture in picture or a resize or something to move the copy. It's two different spots. It has to go underneath the animat. My number one tip whenever using animat, that kind of thing is 
but everything else underneath, outermost effect. So I'm gonna expand nest display by double clicking my clip. So double clicking expands and collapses. Click the inside is the key so you don't replace your animat. Go here, uh, blend category, 3D warp. There we go, because the 3D warp is gonna move the video and then the animat moves the mat, they're separate. So now I can move this over, actually let me resize first. Um, so when I resize, what you're going to start seeing is the mat's going to look funky, but we'll fix that in a second. So I'm kind of eyeball it. Where is this going to go? And so once you get that in place, then you move your mat. Okay. Now this one's super forgiving. I might be able to get away with this. So just shoot everything on white backgrounds. Um, but in this case, actually, I need to delete that. I should be on my, with all my keyframes selected a second. Okay, so this way I'm going to move it, okay? And then I'm gonna resize it and fix it. Now you kind of get an idea why in such a short period of time I had to do a simple example. Um, and I'm getting a lot of refresh challenges, but there we go. Uh, let's say that's perfect. When I step out here, double click to collapse and go down to my time code, drag and play here. Now I've got two of these going and it looks like they're both there. So yeah, I mean, obviously the more intricate your object and the more it moves, the more time you're gonna have to invest, keyframing the mat and that kind of thing. But the key nuts and bolts is two effects, the mat to create the shape and then the 3D warp or a picture in picture to move the fill it has to be the two effects. And so hopefully that helps. And then if I need another one, I copy it again. And then I could just have a whole population of bad melon. All right. Hopefully that made sense. I think it did. We do have some questions coming in, but we'll need to add those to our next session. Um, as right. We are running up on time. Let me go ahead and um, share my screen so everybody knows. Um, so we will get this information for you. So as you see, uh, you can go back to avid.com online learning webinars. This is where we post these contents. Um, and drop me an email at live online learning at avid.com. We'd love to get your ideas for sessions coming up in January as we're building out the calendar. A few more questions from Mary Ann or any of our other products on how you do something or a process or just a feature you'd like to know more about. We would love to hear from you as we're starting to fill out those calendars. So Marianne, thank you again for another amazing session. And I know that we're with you next week as well for following yeah. the blur. <laughs> yeah. So I look forward to that session. And again, yeah, it's awesome. We're so happy to have you and your sessions are always so informative. So I appreciate it. So with that, uh, I guess Marianne, I'll let you get back on with your day and everyone else have a great one. And again, drop us those topics you'd like to hear more about. All right. Thanks guys.